Hi guys, in this video, I'm going to talk about batch normalization. So the idea was introduced in this paper over here from 2015, and it seems to improve training substantially, especially for deep neural networks, but it's not really clear the reasons why. So before we are going to talk about the why, let's first talk about the how. So suppose we have this neural network, what batch normalization does, it takes the inputs to all of these activations. So we have the inputs and the outputs after each activation, and it normalizes it, also known as standardizing. So it subtracts the mean and then divides by the standard deviation. Yeah, so it takes the Z and it subtracts the mean and divides by the standard deviation. Now, it can be done for the Zs and the As. In the original paper, they did it on the Zs. And usually, we also add some epsilon constant to the variance to avoid weird cases where the variance is zero or numerically zero. So we take, we add an epsilon to the variance and then we take the square root of that. Okay, so here it's written again. And if we started with some z's, then we end up with some normalized z's. Okay, and the mean is just computed as the average over the batch that we have. And the sigmas are computed as the sample variance. Now this is done for every neuron. So for each neuron, we have to compute a different mu and a different sigma square. And all operations here are element-wise. So I won't write this uh, Hadamard product. I will just use the this dot instead, but, but yeah, all of the operations in batch norm are element-wise. Now, preferably, we would want to do this over the entire data set. But in practice, the data sets are usually huge and we don't have access uh, to the entire data set at train time. Uh, we only process the data in batches. So uh, we compute the mu's and the sigmas and we normalize per batch. This is why it's also called batch normalization because we don't normalize the entire data, we only normalize the batches. So doing this will make that the neuron input and so we have a neuron and it has an input and then output yeah so the inputs to the neuron uh, will have a mean zero and a standard deviation of one for the batch that enters it at a certain training step but we can also let the training process decide what is the best mean and sigma for that neuron so what we do is we process it some more we create a more expressive let's call it normalized inputs by uh, taking the element-wise product with some gamma parameter plus adding some beta. So basically scaling again and adding some bias, shifting again. And these gamma and beta are learnable parameters. And again, we have them for each neuron. So in this case, if we have three neurons to the network, we will have three different gammas and three different betas for that layer, for this specific layer. But if we have K neurons, we will have K different gammas and K different betas. So this is a one by K vector. Notice we are multiplying this element-wise with the vector itself, which is also one by K. But when we are moving to matrix notation, when we are processing the entire batch, then the Zs will be an N by K matrix, where N is the size of the batch. So in order to do this operation, what we do is broadcasting. So gamma and beta will be duplicated k times in order for these operations to have the correct sizes. This is a small implementation detail, uh, but it's important to note it. So why do we even want to change the mean and the standard deviation of the outputs? I mean, we just normalize them. So what's the point in changing it now? So one of the motivation that is given in the paper is that, for example, for sigmoid activation functions, if the z's have a mean of zero and a sigma of one, we are pretty much restrained to the linear part of the activation. Yeah. So uh, if we plot the sigmoid function, it looks something like this, right? So if we are more or less in this range, then we are very close to the linear part of the activation. And we want maybe to take advantage of the more nonlinear parts, yeah, this, these parts over here. So for example, if we set gamma to be the sigma that we computed and beta to be the mu that we computed, then this transformation brings us back to the original Z. So if the network learns that the best parameters 
bring us back to the original Z, it basically learns the identity transformation. So what we are doing is we are allowing the network to decide what is the best mean and variance for the inputs of this neuron. Uh, if it wants to learn the identity transformation, it can. If it wants to learn something else, it also can. So we give it more expressivity, more capacity. It can express different things and it can do more. Now note that because we subtract the mean, we don't really need any extra bias parameters, the Bs, in the previous layer. So what is the inputs to the neuron if it comes from a feed forward or a linear layer? Then it's just this thing over here. You take the inputs, you multiply it by the weight matrix, and you add the bias. Now, if we compute the mean of the Zs, it's just this thing over here, which is equal to this. We sum the bias n times, n batch time, and then we divide by n batch. So it just remains a B. If we now subtract the mean from the original inputs, then these are the original inputs. This is the mean. The B and B gets canceled. And we are left here with this expression over here. We now also divide by the standard error, but the standard error also only depends on these terms here, uh, squared and summed. So the B doesn't play a role anymore. The B just disappears. So if we have a B in the previous linear layer, after using the batch norm, it doesn't matter what it is. It's just completely irrelevant. So what we can do is just use a linear layer without bias before the batch norm. And now beta will take the role of the B. So adding this beta parameter here, it will take the role of the B and allows us to shift the distribution. So this was the how, at least the forward pass how, we will go back to the derivatives in the next video. Now, before we talk about the why, let's talk about the wow. So what is the effect of using batch norm? So for example, on the ImageNet classification task with an inception architecture, which was the state-of-the-art architecture at the time, they managed to get state-of-the-art accuracy with only 7% of the training time, which is quite remarkable. Also, they are able to increase the learning rate uh, five times more, and this is how they got the 7% of the training time, or they, in some case, they also increased the learning rate by 30. Uh, this still speed up training, not as much as the five, but it also got higher accuracy. Another thing they noticed is that they don't really need dropout. They could just remove it. Uh, the network generalized well, the validation accuracy was good, etc. They had some more slight modifications. I won't go into it. You can read the paper. They managed to use sigmoid activations to get decent results. So these results, I think, is with Varelu or some variation of Varelu. But they managed to also get pretty decent results with a sigmoid, where up until uh, batch norm, you couldn't get any decent results with sigmoid activations on the image net classification problem. Yeah, they also managed to improve the state of the art result with an ensemble of networks. And so, yeah, it's it's quite remarkable. And it, batch norm became very successful and it became a default in most uh, deep architectures. So now let's start talking about the why. So what was the motivation behind batch norm? So it was long known that normalizing the inputs to a neural network improves learning. But this is only basically done on not even the first layer. It's done on the zero layer. It's done on the inputs. The question is, why not do this on the rest of the layers. Because neural networks, they they are basically stacking operations on top of each other, right? So we have a, a linear layer, we have some inputs, we have a linear layer, then we have an activations on them, then we have another linear layer, then we have another activations on them, et cetera, et cetera. So instead of just doing it here, maybe we also should do it here and here, et cetera. And so this was the motivation behind batch norm. The explanation the authors give is that doing these normalization reduces what they call the internal covariate shift, which is a fancy expression, which basically means the distribution of the activation. So the, the shift means the movement, the, and the internal covariate means the distribution of the activation. So what the authors claim is that in regular neural network, the distribution of the inputs to the activations, they change drastically throughout the learning, but with batch norm, they don't change so much. So here there's a plot from the paper where they show on a single neuron how the distribution of the input changes. The middle line is the median, the upper line and the lower line are the percentiles, I think 15 and 85 percentiles. And you can see there's some big change here in the beginning in the learning, and then it kind of settles 
Whereas with batch norm, the distribution, at least the medians and the two percentiles, uh, they seem quite constant. They, they develop more smoothly. So here we don't have this uh, mess over here, this big change over here, which they call internal covariate shift, the movement of the distribution. Now, technically, we are not changing the whole distribution with batch norm. We are just subtracting the mean and uh, dividing by the standard deviation. So we are just fixing the mean and the standard deviation or the first and second moments. And actually, this is one of the reasons why they choose to apply batch norms to disease, to the inputs to the activations and not to the A's, the outputs of the activations. They claim that disease are more Gaussian-like. And so if we have a Gaussian, the Gaussian is completely determined by the first two moments. And so fixing that will make the distributions more similar. Okay, so this is the high level explanation. They also give a bit of a more low level explanation. They claim that we can use bigger learning rates with batch norm. And why can we use bigger learning rates? Well, on the sigmoid and tan H, they claim we can prevent saturation. So their claim is that small changes to weights in early layers can lead to big changes in activations in later layers. Now, this means that if we are using saturating activation functions like sigmoid and tan H, we might end up in regions where the gradients are very small. So we talked about it in the activations video, where if this is the sigmoid, uh, for example, activation, then the gradients here are very small. So if we are pushed, so if disease are pushed into the far ends of the activations to big numbers, basically, the gradients can be very small. And so this kind of motivates using smaller learning rates to avoid this problem. But if we normalize the activations, we prevent the small changes from becoming big changes and we can use larger learning rate. Now I have to say, I'm not sure how much I agree with this. I tried to experiment a bit with this first claim that small changes to weights in early layers can lead to big changes in activations in later layers. When using sigmoid or tan H especially, um, the sigmoids and tan H kind of have this constraining property where small changes to the inputs of a sigmoid don't result in big changes to the outputs of the sigmoid. So I'm not sure how much I agree with this whole claim. And also from my limited experiments, I didn't notice that creating small changes in the weights of early layers lead to huge changes in later layers. But anyways, this is what they claim. Another reason why we can use bigger learning rates is that it prevents weights and gradients from exploding. So the claim here is that I learning rate may increase the scale of the weights and gradients. And this I totally agree with. From my experience, using bigger learning rates usually increases the norm of the weights and of the gradients. So batch norm is immune to the scale of the parameters. So these are the inputs, these are disease. Remember, we don't have the bias term anymore. Well, if we multiply the W, the weight matrix by C, after passing it through the batch norm, it's actually equivalent if we didn't do that, if we just use the original weights. Likewise, for the gradient, if we take the gradient with regards to the activations, the outputs of the previous layers, then it's exactly the same. And if we take the gradient with regards to the weights themselves, well, it's actually equal to the gradient without the scaling divided by the scaling. So if we scale the weights to be bigger, the gradients will be smaller in that case. So I think this reason from all the reasons listed in the paper is the reason that I find most logical and appealing. And this can maybe explain why you can use higher learning rates with batch norm. The last thing they note is that it, batch norm kind of has a regularization effect. So during training, the network no longer produces deterministic values for a given training example. It really depends on the batch in which this specific training example is with. And so if you have this noise that is depending on the batch and every epoch you will have a different batch. So this reduces the need for regularization. And as mentioned, they in some cases completely removed dropout and also lowered significantly the L2 regularization. So that was the explanations they gave in their paper. But three years after there were two papers that came out who completely contested their explanation. One is this paper over here, and this paper claims three things. The first is that internal covariate shift doesn't affect learning at all. So it sets up an experiment where it's on purposely changing the distribution of the inputs to the activations 
after using batch norm. And they show that these networks that have severe covariate shift performed almost as good as batch norm, and in any case, much better than the regular networks, but they have a severe covariate shift. So this proves that internal covariate shift doesn't affect learning at all. The second thing they do is that they claim that batch norm doesn't even improve the internal covariate shift. So they use some other matrix. I won't go into it, but basically according to their definition, batch norm doesn't even improve the ICS. And the third thing they do in the paper is that they say that what batch norm really does, it improves the optimization landscape. It makes it significantly more smooth. And so what is the optimization landscape? Well, we are doing gradient descent over the weights. And every time we move the weights, we have a different loss, a different error term. If we take a small step and suddenly the loss becomes huge or becomes really low, then we have something that is not smooth. But if we take small steps and the loss changes moderately, then we have a more smooth landscape. And so this is a graph from their paper. And here you see how the loss changes over time. You can see that in the standard network, the loss has some pretty big changes, where in the batch norm, it, the changes are not so big. Here they show how the gradient changes. So, so they measure the norm of the gradient, and they, you can see that in each step in the standard, the norms can be quite high. Again, with the batch norm, they are not as high. And here they show what they call the effective beta smoothness, which means, so we have a point here and we are taking a step in the gradient here. Well, let's see what happens to the gradient as we move from here to here. Maybe the gradient here will be bigger, maybe the gradient here will be smaller. So we look at all the gradients from this point to this point and we measure their norm and we take the maximum of that. So in red, you can see that the maximum for the standard network can be quite high, whereas for the batch norm, it's pretty low. There's another paper that came out about the same time, and it says that the reason also has something to do with optimization, but it explains it that using batch norm kind of separates the, the concerns of optimization with optimizing the length of the step that we have to take, so the gamma, and the direction, the W, the weights. And what it claims is that batch norm kind of normalizes the weights. So they show that using batch norm kind of creates a normalized W where the norm is an induced norm by the covariant matrix of the inputs. I won't go into it that much. Also, both of these paper, I just leafed through. So you might want to check them out, but I think both of them kind of give uh, the same picture. They are both saying, hey, what the original authors claim to be the reasons are not the real reasons. The real reasons have something to do with optimization and allowing for better optimization. Okay, now let's talk about the derivatives of the batch norm. 